All right, good morning. I guess the mic's not all oh, there. There I come. It's always nice whenever the mic comes on <coughs> when I have to begin to clear my throat. <clears throat> that first good morning, by the way, before the mic came on was epic. It was very smooth and sounded great. Mic starts coming on, and I sound hacky. I'm feeling fine. How's everybody doing this morning? I'm well, doing pretty well. Great. Well, it's uh, great to be with everyone this morning. Uh, we do have several new faces for those who I've not met before. You haven't met me. I'm Adam. I'm one of the elders here at Grassroots Church. And you also uh, got to be well acquainted with another elder, Mark, who was just here. And I just got to give a special shout out to, you know, to two different groups. One group, worship team, thank you so much. Uh, that was great. I uh, appreciate you all and your sacrifice that you put in to lead us through worship, through singing. But also, I got I to gotta thank Mark. <laughs> we were going over this morning's liturgy uh, a few minutes before this service started, and uh, Mark was like, well, I'm doing everything but preaching. <laughs> He's like, I'm doing the announcements and all these different things. He's like, I'm doing everything except preaching. And I actually asked earlier this week for the entire passage we'll be covering this morning to be read. So he handled all of that like a champ. Thank you, Mark. That was great. Thank you, Mark, for that. So if you are not there, I want to highly encourage you all, please open your Bibles to 1 John chapter 2. Uh, and as Mark just read, we're covering the entire uh, passage that has to do with ch uh, children of God. That goes from chapter 2, verses 28 through chapter 3, verse 24. And this is an amazing passage, an amazing set of verses uh, whenever I was preparing for this lesson for the past few weeks, I struggled in like picking, why don't, I'm like, oh, I don't even know what verse to use in order to preach this message. I uh, eventually decided, you know what, why not all of them? And this passage is also incredibly unique and beautiful and wonderful in that, and I almost swear by this if I was a swearing man, but you can almost pull out any verse or set of verses, and whatever you pull out of this passage within those verses will be well representative for the entire chapter that we're covering. So that was my uh, struggle, really, for the past few weeks. It's like, well, what verses should I use for this great message? Eventually decided, well, let's just talk about everything now before you all think, don't do it, Adam. Don't go word by word. I wish I could. Now, we do like to preach in an expository way here on Sunday mornings at Grassroots Church, which really means verse by verse within context of the original intent of the author, as well as the readers of this original content. But clearly, we're not going to be able to go word by word. Uh, basically, I want to conclude that mini introduction by just saying this. Later on uh, this evening, when you're at home or hanging out with your families, doing whatever it is you do on Sunday afternoons, if you think, man, Adam did not touch about how, touch on, if, you pract if you're a practitioner of sin, you're a you're a child of Satan. That's implied. That's there. I agree with it. Uh, and if, if you're being led to look more into that, you do your thing, okay? So just know my bias up front. And it's also strange, we're, uh, back in 1 John, we've had several weeks off from uh, this series. Uh, several weeks ago, we did Scatter to Serve, so we were not in the book of 1 John. And last week, we celebrated our 10-year church anniversary. Church anniversary? Yeah, church anniversary. We'll call it that. Church anniversary. Uh, so we haven't been in 1 John for a while. To get everyone on the same page, to get everyone up to speed, we are going through the entire book of 1 John, which is not a very long book, but the series that we're going through is titled That You May Know. Our series goal, and again, this is for every lesson, uh, every Sunday, every sermon. Our series goal is for us to live out our lives in faith in Jesus and Jesus alone. Now, this book was authored by the Apostle John, and this was a rebuttal, a response, kind of like a critique to a first century movement that was happening culturally in this region where Christians, believers, were under the influence, beginning to get under the influence of what we now refer to as the Gnostics. Uh, Gnosticism coming from uh, the root word gnosis, which means knowledge. Essentially what was happening, the apostles after Christ's ascension preached and proclaimed the gospel throughout that entire Mesopotamia, like Eurasian region, and they were trying to stay true to the original word that was given to them from Christ. But outside influences began to change that culture, particularly with the Gnostics. They began to teach that there is a hidden mystical truth 
that the original gospel was not addressing. So when you think Gnosticism in this context, think about hidden mystical knowledge as though the, you know, the church, like here at Grassroots, you know, we're hiding some type of very important knowledge from you all for whatever type of reason. Uh, we see that very evident today in liberal theology, this idea of pursue knowledge uh, and try to achieve knowing that which is not covered by Scripture. So John is addressing that first century movement, which again still persists in our culture uh, today. And uh, chapter 2 gives us several indications of what it is that we, as born-again believers, should know. And I'm going to start real quick, uh, if you don't mind looking back. Chapter 2, verses 20 through 21, John literally says, uh, children, I'm not writing to you anything you do not know. I'm writing to you because you do know. So John is writing to the, the first century church saying, look, I'm not here to enlighten you on any hidden knowledge. I'm here to talk to you about that which you already know. And that is very encouraging for us believers today because there is no hidden knowledge from us. Do we know everything? No. But sometimes that can ab absolutely be a very good thing. John is writing to the church to encourage them to dive deeper into that which you already know. Christian, we know right now in this moment everything that God wants us to actually know. And that is primarily that we can have a relationship with God the Father through his son, Jesus Christ. We already know everything. John is writing to these people, to this early church, saying, I'm not here to tell you anything new. Uh, I'm writing to you because you already know. Uh, also in chapter 2, verse 3, uh, John is addressing the different evidence evidences uh, that one would find if they are truly born again of Christ. Verse 3 mentions that if we follow his commands, we know we know him. And verse 5, if we keep his word, we know we know him. And as previously discussed, this is not a way to achieve a certain status. This is not legalistic, work-based, something that you earn, you don't earn uh, knowledge of Christ. But when we come to Christ in faith, the, the product, the evidence is that we want to, we desire to follow his commands and his word. So today we're picking up on what it means to be a child of God. What are some of the characteristics of a child of God. Before we get into what that means, what a child of God looks like, how they act, behave, and believe, um, I want to ask you all a question. And you can be honest, and if, you're, and if you're truly honest in answering this question, you're probably going to be far out in left field, because that's what happens to me every time I consider something like this. But if you were given an opportunity by whatever means, I mean, if you can come across a genie out on a beach, or if you were you're in a dream, some, into, some you know, angel came to you uh, and presented you with a question, that is, if you could know for certain one thing, just one thing, know it through and through, like you would know it, what would that be? And I've been thinking about that question for the past few weeks. Uh, I, I tend to end up in like weird conspiracy theory land <laughs> almost every time. Now, I will let you all know, I am no conspiracy theorist. I don't believe in like not most of what uh, those in the conspiracy land tend to adhere to, but I do follow conspiracy theories. If anything, for me, oftentimes it's like urban legends, like, ooh, interesting stories. But there's one, one kind of recent historical uh, conspiracy theory that drives me nuts. That is the assassination of JFK. Like, I don't get it. Even recently, it seems like every few years, there's a big FOIA push, uh, Freedom of Information Act, where someone will try to get information from the federal government, some records about how John F. Kennedy was assassinated back in the early 60s. And it, and it always happens in the same way. It's like, hey, in a couple days, a big uh, document dump, which is going to expose more uh, information about what actually happened during JFK's assassination. But inevitably, Documents come out, and they're so heavily redacted, there's no new information at all, and we got to wait a couple more years for someone else to do the same thing. But I would really, like, what happened? It does not make sense to me. Also, uh, I would like to know the moon. I know that's weird. Moon, the moon makes no sense to me. Uh, I'm not even talking about the lunar landing. Like, it makes no sense. Like, I, I can watch a documentary on the moon and, and, like, where I started. It makes no sense. It doesn't even move. You don't even know what's on the backside of it. 
If I'm looking at a full moon here, what do they see in China? Can they see the moon when I see the moon? I don't get the moon. Moon makes no sense to me. I want to know the moon uh, if I can know anything. But to be more serious, I think if a lot of Christians were honest, if we were honest uh, with ourselves, we would like to know, be like, I would love to know that I am going to be with Christ in heaven. I would like to know uh, that I am a true believer, a child of God. Uh, so we're going to dive into what it means to be a child of God through that lens. And there are three aspects of a child of God's character that we find in this passage. Again, I am not going to read through every single line. Mark already did a great job of that. But we should have some verses for references on the screen. Uh, so the three characteristics, according to this passage, of a child of God are going to be, one, uh, God's children abide in him. Two, God's children practice righteousness. And three, God's children love others. So God's children abide in him, practice righteousness, and God's children love others. So number one, the first observation or point is that God's children abide in him. Verse 28 starts out literally stating that. Little children abide in him. And that is the commandment that is given to us by John. This is not a recommendation, not a request. This is John saying to us Christians, little children, abide in him. Not only that, uh, but it goes on to say so that at his appearance, we may not shrink away in shame, but have confidence before him. Uh, Before we get into what it means to abide, Think about how children act. I do not want to use anyone's children, not even my children, for this illustration, so I'm pulling an illustration out from my history. Uh, Whenever I was in kindergarten, I, well, the class that I was in, every weekend we got to sign out toys like stuffed animals and things like that, and there was a kid named Robert who (laughs) every weekend kept getting the same toy, which is not cool, not fair at all. Uh, But I really wanted that toy one weekend, but he beat me to it, so I did what any rational, like, five-year-old kindergartner would do. I punched him right in his gut, and I took his toy. And then a few minutes later, the teacher showed up when Robert crying, uh, and I I didn't get to keep the toy, by the way. Uh, I got sent to the principal's office, and that was the... That was the one and only time I ever got in trouble for any physical altercation. I just wanted the toy. The principal's office was an absolute nightmare. My principal was a very strong, stern uh, Christian man. He was also part of our church, which made it all the more awkward. But if I remember correctly, I was just in the office crying the entire time. He was like, this is, I don't even know what I'm doing here. And he just like looked at me. But I remember him dialing the secretary, or like the secretary, tell the teachers like, he's, he's fine. Just like give him some space, uh, pretty much. But that's not the worst part. My household was very strict growing up. Like if we got in trouble with school, we're going to, we got in a little bit more trouble at home. So I rode the bus home as per usual. But instead of going to my house, like I would normally do, I went to my grandparents, who we live pretty close by, to like, you know, nonchalantly like play on the swings and on the slide and stuff, you know, so no one would know what happened. I shrank away because I knew what I did was wrong, and I did not want to face the truth. I did not want to face the consequences. (laughs) Friends, Jesus will appear again one day. We will all face him, literally face to face. And in that moment, It would be heartbreaking for anyone here this morning to feel as though uh, you need to shrink away because of guilt or shame. We don't have to engage in that particular option. Instead, at his appearance, we can have confidence. How? By simply abiding in him. Uh, If you want to turn there or just make a reference to it so you can check it out later on, John chapter 15 gives us what Jesus said about what it means to abide in him. So combining John 15 with a series, if you want to check it out, you can, it's on YouTube, Steve uh, Lawson has a detailed series throughout the book of 1 John, and I'm, I'm not kidding, there's a lot. He did his like doctoral thesis on one of the chapters, there's a lot of information there. So what I'm about to say, know that my two references are John 15, Jesus, and to a lesser degree, uh, Steve Lawson. But what does it mean to abide in him? Because that passage is uh, mentioned several times throughout these couple of chapters where we're called to abide in him. He abides in us. What does it mean to abide in something? Uh, You can break it down into three different aspects. One, what it means to abide means to remain. 
to simply remain in him and to remain in his word. Uh, So throughout the world, throughout history, there are a lot of different philosophies, right? There are a lot of different worldviews and I think somewhat a misleading uh, approach is that you can kind of like pick and choose your worldview. I think you kind of just believe what you believe a lot of times, unless you have divine influence. But it's easy to kind of like hopscotch, the the cultural way, to like make your your faith individual specific uh, to you. So it might look like something like this. To not remain in him and in his word would be someone who maybe grew up in church, adheres to Christianity, was baptized, went to college, said, ah, I think Marxist is actually better, becomes a Marxist, but then again realizes, well, man, the Buddha's got some cool stuff, and then throws all these different uh, theologies and philosophies and worldviews together to come up with a thing, an entity, a like theological Frankenstein, um, specific to that individual. And oftentimes it ends up being absolutely like inclusive, right? Like, well, Jesus was kind of right, Buddha kind of right, Marx, he's not, I'll tell you right now, no, don't do that. Uh, but that, that's not cool. Christians, Marxism, Christians, a little, little bit of tension there. Uh, but to remain means to stay put in him, to remain in him. Jesus in John chapter 15 tells us that he is the true vine, that we are the branches as we remain in him, as a branch remains a part of that vine, fruit is produced. And Jesus also goes on to say that my father is the gardener, the one collecting the fruit. Good trees produce good fruits. Bad trees produce bad fruit. Apple trees produce apples. It's pretty simple. When we, that's true, you can look it up. Uh, I know the world's kind of relative now, but apple trees produce apples. I was thinking about pine cones, too. I don't know. Like, are pine, are like pine cones fruit, or would like the fruit of a pine tree be the needles? I don't know. I was looking at a pine tree the other day. Uh, but the point being, when we remain in him, right, remain in his word, the fruit that is produced in our lives reflects him in which we abide. Remain in him. If a branch is disconnected from the vine, the branch inevitably dies. Good fruit, excuse me, a good tree produces good fruit. So remain in him in his word throughout the highs and lows of our lives. As seasons change, as we go throughout uh, different mountains and valleys, remain true in his word, remain in him. Uh, So to abide means to remain. It also means to rest. Uh, When talking about spiritual fruit, usually the best reference tends to be Galatians chapter 5, where Paul lists the different fruits of the spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, Self-control, thank you. Yeah, I struggle with self-control. I think self-control, faithfulness, if I knew that. Anyway, off the top of my head. But anyway, literally the fruit of the Spirit is listed. And who would not want some of that fruit, right? I think that most people, if we're being honest, like who doesn't want peace? Who does not want joy? If we are not abiding in Him, we cannot have that fruit produced in our lives. For example, if you seek peace, again, who doesn't, and you try to, on your own, produce that fruit, that is not very peaceful, right? If you're trying to produce joy independently, like in and of yourself, without remaining and abiding in Him, that's not very joyful because we can't do it. This is the vine producing fruit through us. Our job is to simply rest in Him. We don't have to work for these products. God produces them through us. So we abide in Him by remaining in Him, resting in him, and finally relying on him in all the different situations we find ourselves in in life. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 19, Jesus tells his disciples uh, that they are going to be one day brought before the authorities, and it's not going to go very well. But Jesus tells them, he's like, but don't, don't be afraid. In that moment, don't worry about what to say or how to speak. I will give you the words to say in that particular moment. So some of you might right now might know for a fact that whether today or tomorrow, you're going to have to have a tough conversation with someone, which is probably like one of the most anxiety-inducing situations. No one, I hope you don't. Uh, like, I can't wait to have a tough conversation with this person. Managers, for those of you that are in here, uh, to consider a future encounter with someone that produces anxiety and fear. We try to plan it everything out like now in the moment, like what I'm going to say is this, and then this is going to happen, this is going to happen. 
Ultimately, we don't know. But what we can do is remain in him and trust him that in that situation, in that moment when we're having that tough conversation, for example, fruit is still being produced. Love, joy, peace, patience, kind, self-control. Sorry about that one. Uh, but we are, as God's children, called to abide in him. So the first characteristic of a child of God is that, one, God's children abide in him, remain, rest, and rely on him. Uh, the second characteristic, according to this passage, of a child of God is that a child of God practices righteousness. Uh, so specifically, we're looking at verses 7 through 10. Uh, explicitly, it is mentioned that one who practices righteousness is righteous. And again, don't, don't take that too much out of context. The Bible does teach that no one is righteous. No one, our deeds are not righteous. We cannot achieve righteousness because that's not a, we can't do it. Uh, righteousness is God working through us in faith. And we are called as his children to practice righteousness, not to practice sin. So don't go, well, if I sin once, I'm not a child of God. You're going to sin. It happens. Or, oh, I need to climb that ladder of morality to be righteous. That is not what's being said. This is a practice of righteousness. And this works on two different layers, on the macro sense as well as the personal like here and now sense. So think about this. Reflect on your life right now, um, everyone. If you can look at the, the bigger picture, the bigger trends, could you say honestly, like as you consider your life, those that are around you, do you see righteous fruit being produced? Right? If you can say, yes, I, I, I see love in my family and like other friends, and yes, absolutely, that is not your righteousness per se. It is God producing fruit in your life. If you were to take a step back and consider your life and being like, man, for the past 20 years, I have continued to be angry and jealous and spiteful, that's a problem. Like, that is not a practice of righteousness, right? So, bigger picture. Are there trends and evidence of God's righteous fruit being produced in your lives? Because if we are called to be children, we're supposed to be like our Heavenly Father, and He is righteous. Righteousness will be produced in spite of our shortcomings. That's awesome. But also on a more personal uh, note, like for the here and now, this says that God's children are to, be, are to practice righteousness, like present right now. If you're like me, I have, I think I called it this week, post-social anxiety. I do not get, being here this morning, like I am not nervous right now speaking before you all. I was not nervous coming up here, but 20 minutes after the sermon is over, I'm freaking out. I'm like, no, oh, what did I say? Like, what did I do? Did I actually do that? I have like po some weird type of post-social uh, anxiety. Um, and it's easy for me to get distracted from where I am in that particular moment, thinking about what has happened or even thinking about what could happen. We are called to right now be practitioners of God's righteousness. Like right now, as you're listening to me in, in these, I was going to say pews, let's call them pews, right? Right now in the pews or even on the live stream, if you're hearing me right now, we are called to right now in this particular moment, no matter what happened this morning, no matter what we're thinking about for Wednesday, no matter the situation, like right now we are to be practitioners of righteousness. This is both big picture as well as the personal close here and now. But think about this idea of practicing for just a moment. That is a here and now uh, concept, but practice helps us to be prepared for something that is uh, about to happen. I spoke with a few of you all about this this week. I, I do my best to follow our military. I like geopolitics and military stuff. Uh, like history. I'm not saying I'm an expert. I'm just more entertained by it. Uh, but our United States military engages in military exercises with a few of our allies. The whole point of one of those military exercises is to see our flaws as a military. It's like, well, what are we missing out on? And there was a recent report that came out, and this has happened in the past few months, that our United States Air Force most um, efficient fighter jet is the F-22 Raptor, which just sounds cool. I mean, that thing is, I heard someone once say that it is basically a war crime in the air. Like, it's, it's a ghost, um, essentially. But our F-22 Raptor lost in a recent exercise against the Filipino Army? 
And the pilot was flying a uh, Korean-made jet, the F-A-50. Now, again, there's not a lot of information out of, on about this because it's military, and good luck with that. But a few days ago, I kept seeing different reports across my social media about America's military is on the decline. Look, these Korean-made jets are beating our best stealth fighter. And that was the overall narrative. And I came across so much, so many people, like, I don't know. I don't want to say, like, freaking out, but <laughs> definitely not chill about the situation. But if you dig deeper into why our military engages in those exercises, it's to recognize flaws. The F-22 Raptor is so much more advanced than any other aircraft when it comes to stealth and destructive capabilities that it doesn't engage fairly. For uh, one, it has to have extra weight on it, so it's slowed down and not nearly as maneuverable. And also, it can't engage the other fighters, fighter jets, because its capacity is so much further out that in order for it to be a fair fight, uh, about half of its capabilities have to be stripped away so it's a fair fight. It's basically one of our pilots fighting with one hand behind their back. And yes, we lost one time to a Korean-made uh, FA-50, I think is what it was. But here's the point. Now, we can't say that all the military, like, this is terrible, the military is messed up, it's on the decline... No, our military does that to recognize flaws because it, when we, if we do get involved in combat with that particular uh, jet, guess what we now know? We know the flaws. We know the extent of its capabilities. We practice to recognize flaws. We cannot be completely righteous in all the deeds that we do. We cannot do that right now. But what we can do is practice them day in, day out, at work, at home. <laughs> Shopping at Walmart. If, the, if you can be righteous and shopping at Walmart, God bless you. You are a saint. But practice righteousness not to achieve something, but to show that we cannot produce righteousness on our own. It is God producing righteousness through us. So later on, whenever a situation comes up, we've been practiced to the point where whenever accidents happen, uh, car accidents happen, or someone falls ill, anything like that, we are prepared in that situation. Practice does not make perfect, but practice does make for preparedness. So Christian, children of God, we are called to practice righteousness. So if we abide in him, we will practice righteousness to reveal where we are falling short so that we may rely on him. But that is not exclusively a vertical sentiment either. Uh, the third aspect of a character of the character of a child of God is that there are also horizontal aspects to it. Uh, so verses 16 through 18 talk about love. We are again, as God's children, commanded uh, to love the brothers. Darren spoke on this a few weeks ago. Check out that lesson. I think it was two lessons ago if you want more information about it. But often the question will arise is like, well, who are the brothers? Is that only Christians in my church, Christians around the world, or other people that are not in the church? The answer is just yes across the board. We're here in proximity with each other, right? This Christian community we have here, grassroots. Uh, so it's easier for us to, on the ground, express love uh, to each other. John commands us, yes, to love the brothers, but in a certain specific type of way. It's not just any type of love, not like love as the world would define it. And there are so many different worldly views on love that are all self-centered in some way. Jesus Christ, the Christian faith, offers a truth that you will not find anywhere outside of the Christian faith. That is that Jesus, according to this passage, what is love? That he laid down his life. What is love in the Christian faith? Christian faith is someone, love in the Christian faith is someone who can willingly, can intentionally make selfless sacrifices to someone else's benefit. There is no self involved in that love. Jesus epitomized that. He did not have his life taken away. He gave his life for you and for me. He willingly, sacrificially, selflessly laid down his life for us, and we are called to do the same uh, with everyone. Here in Grassroots Church, the church at large in the community, the global church, and yes, we are called to love those outside of the church. So love is an action. 
I remember my, my grandmother used to have a book. I have no idea how long ago this was, but I saw a book on her mantle. It's, it was called Love is a Verb. And I remember seeing that for the first time, and I was like, well, yeah, it's also a noun and an adjective. Totally missing the point of the book. The point is that love is not something that can merely be spoken. It's not something that can simply be declared. Love is action, the action of selfless, intentional uh, sacrifice, which Jesus Christ personified. So if you think about the church right now and how we exercise love, both here in Grassroots Church and outside, and consider love in the world, there should be some stark contrasts. I'm convinced that according to John in both this passage and passages we read earlier, that our love within the, in, within the church should be so pure and good and selfless that, selfless that those outside of the church, outside of the faith, would see this supernatural love and just be drawn to it because he can't find it out in the world. My concern this morning is that we should, we are called to love each other in such a way that the world around, the community around us is impacted. And if, that's, if that starts here uh, and, and makes its way through all the different smaller communities throughout the country, that is a national, like, loving revival. But that's not the case. Instead, unfortunately, the world, the culture, the, the way that outside of the church engages in love affects how we even interact with each other here. There are, as I look across this room, we do have a lot of diversity in many different ways. We have different backgrounds. Many of you come from different denominations, different political theories, and that is all fine and well. We are rooted in God's truth and in God's gospel. We have that in common. That binds us together in love. But the world, and you can see this exercised in media and just at Walmart even, we're so self centered. It's, it's a, a very self-centered type, to the point where if, you know, I come across someone and we're having a good conversation, but I find out that, well, I disagree with like this one opinion they have, so they're gone, the entire person completely dismissed. It would be easy for me to stand up here and rant about cancel culture out large in the media, but is that creeping up in our churches behind the pulpits, behind or within all the pews to where instead of loving each other, we're taking tools of the world and how they fight and canceling each other out instead of overcoming those differences and just loving each other. And here's the sad part about it as well. There are so many needs out in the community between drug addiction, uh, recovery, broken families, children, and there are so many needs to be met. Whenever we are self-centered, self-focused, like a selfish love, we don't even recognize whenever a brother is in need. Close our hearts to a brother or a sister in need out in the community, uh, whereas if we were looking for opportunities to love, we would be able to meet that need. We are not called to love the way the world loves. Let our definition of love come from him who authored it, and that is Jesus Christ. As children of God, our characteristics should be that. We abide in him. Through, him, through us, he produces righteous fruit. We practice righteousness, fall short all the time, but there will be a situation in all of our lives where someone throughout this week, maybe even today, if we're looking for an opportunity to love them, that opportunity will be right there. And if we're practiced, we'll be able to meet that need. That is the way that Christ authored it. His children abide in him, practice his righteousness, and we love others. We love each other and we don't fight with the ways of the world. If I, I have two applications by way of review. Uh, the f one is uh, to call everyone to examine themselves, but also uh, the second would be I want to encourage everyone. So first, this is a call to examine. We need to constantly go to God's Word and to see Jesus' righteousness every day, many times throughout the day. Uh, to be led by the Spirit in order to see the areas of our lives where we're falling short so that way we can rely on Him. We have to constantly examine ourselves. Let's not get into a stale position of we already got it all figured out, there's nothing new I can learn. No, every day, die to ourselves and to see Him 
his holiness and his righteousness. Let's examine ourselves. Where is their sin? Where have we not repented? Where can we forgive others? Let's evaluate our righteousness based on him, the source of righteousness. But also, number two, I want to encourage everyone this morning, think about this. You are called, Christian, to the mission field in every aspect of your life, at your home, as fathers, mothers, sons, daughters, uncles, uh, in the workplace, as teachers, as students, I mean, across the board. Your life is your mission field. And get that you're not alone. You have been given all the knowledge, all the tools, everything you need to succeed in fulfilling God's will for your life in those areas. I don't want to come here and be like, you got this, but if you abide in Christ, rely on him, trust him, you do got this. Uh, He is there with you. So be encouraged that by having faith in him, there will be righteous fruit uh, produced in all of our lives. So that's where I'm going to conclude today. I do all, like always want to open myself up. If anyone has any comments, questions, or any needs at all, please let me know or let Mark know. Be happy to pray with anyone and uh, to discuss anything that we went over this morning. But I thank you all for the opportunity to bring this word. I'll go ahead and pray and uh, let Mark close us out. Father God, I thank you for this morning. Jesus, I thank you for your love. Uh, Jesus, that we have been so blessed that we can see you. All love, all light emanates from you. And I pray that Grassroots Church will be a beacon of your light and your hope in this community. Father, I pray that this church and every church you know, around the world who proclaims you would love you so much to the point where that love would spill over to others. It's a very hostile world All right now, Jesus, and we need you. Um, may our faith always be in you and not of ourselves. Thank you for it all as always. Jesus, in your name we pray. Amen. <laughs>